I know you people are probably going to be watching this later on on the stream, but you know what? Sometimes. But you get the point. You guys know. Let's go ahead and head to it, shall we? Yeah. All right. Have I got a good one for you? Yeah. Yeah. I was gonna do it earlier today, but for some reason it just kept glitching out on me. So I decided to wait till now. I think it was a good choice on my end. I haven't waited till now, also. Yeah. Everything's gonna happen for a reason, after all. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Yeah, I got this one right in the fucking bag. What did I do here? By the way, if I say a swear word that's universally unacceptable, I'm just gonna I'm gonna bleep it out by mouthing it instead of saying it. Well, that's just I'd, I'd say it, but basically I'd have to silence myself as I say it. I'd have to mouth the words, you know, without actually having a sound come in my mouth. But you understand. You guys know this. You understand. Right? By the way, guys, in case you're wondering, this is a quick preview sample of one of my new My Paradox tracks, dubbed The Millennial Judgment. It's going to be on my second rewritten history album. No, history rewritten. No. I plan to do a three-part album saga on the fallout of the Battle of Armageddon and the subsequent thousand years that followed. say the music soothes the savage beast. Not that Karma's a savage beast, of course she's not. She's just, you know, she's a bitch. There's nothing wrong with her being a bitch. That's what female dogs are, they're technically bitches. But yeah, you guys understand. It's really not that hard to figure out. And all in all, I'm just trying to make sense of it. Just wandering by as I go through this hell that is life, and what have you. Or whatever f***ing you call it. Because I have no f***ing idea about this sh anymore. But yeah, you got it. Pretty simple. Notice how I'm censoring myself here when I when I say words like f or and or something, you know? Notice how I'm censoring myself when I say these words. And despite the fact that I'm going to be swearing a lot in this video, I would like to point out that whenever I do swear at any point, save for a few exceptions like damn or hell or bitch, I'm going to silence and censor any other curse word out. Those three words I mentioned earlier, they're the only exceptions to the rule. And damn me if I haven't figured out this thing called life already. Hell, you know? Son of a bitch. Anyway, just giving a rough example. But yeah, in the grand scheme of it, the point I try to make sometimes is very simple, very clear and very straight to the point. I'm not always the best human being. No one is really. 
the best human being is the actual Son of God in Jesus Christ. He was the only human being to live a perfect life for his entire lifespan. For dying. But you get it. No one else is going to come close. No one else. Dogs need 24-hour attention and supervision. That's just how they are. Without that supervision, it's just hard for many of them to function. They can't survive without human assistance, you know. But we all know this. It's, it's nothing that we haven't learned in school or any of that. And all this zippity-doo-dah garbage. Whatever lies we were told in the public school setting about how socialism is a great in thing. No, it's not. That's bullshit. And you know it. You know, seeing that I've gotten this far in my life, it's just genuinely shocking to me that that with everything that's happened and everything that I've put myself... You know, nobody puts me through anything. I, if anything, I'm the one that puts myself through it all just to prove that I belong, just to prove where I stand in life, and just to prove that I'm not just a mistake that was made by God. I'll be at one that was rectified literally countless ages in advance but which is basically humanity humanity is a mistake albeit an intentional one and one that he rectified himself but that's just my philosophy my philosophy is all kinds of up but you know that I have a very screwed up mind yes I do very screwed up mind for reasons that I'm not gonna go into because obviously you guys know and the more you know, the better, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you this much. I don't know how I'm going to fare in the long run in life, but I damn sure know I won't amount to much. Whatever I do amount to, that's not going to mean a thing because some money hungry attention like Chelsea Clinton or anyone in the Clinton family anyone that's a politician really you know it's really sad when when money has to be so worthless to the point in which if you're not in bed with Rothschild you can't have any of it it's really sad Yesterday on a stream hosted by my good friends so many badgers you may be more than happy to check out his mixer page and maybe give him a maybe give him a couple thousand shards maybe 20,000 if you're feeling generous maybe 200,000 if you're in a Santa Claus like mood but yeah so many badgers is really really talented at what he does he's a very very good gamer a lot better of a gamer than I'll ever be I can just admit that straightforward and shoot you straight and I'd still be right. I mean, granted from time to time, my ability to tell the truth sometimes is crookeder than a crow's d but you understand. That's, that's an old expression, of course, that my mom and my older cousin Daniel used to quip. Because they had lots of clever lines of that of that caliber. Lots. 
Not just in my mom's family line, but in my cousin's family line and my dad's too. You know, the way that it's, it's just everything just comes together in so many ironic twists and turns that it's just hard to keep track anymore. So yesterday on So Many Badgers channel, they were discussing WWE, him and, and another guy who was co-streaming alongside him. They were playing Forza, I think Forza Horizon 4 or whatever the heck it was. I don't fucking know because I don't know from a sh soul. But I pitched to them my idea for a three hour... I told them famously, I quipped, well not famously, maybe later it will be famous, but I quipped very famously that I could book a better Monday Night Raw than anyone on Creative put together and it would be the best episode. I told them this is exactly what I said. Give me a chance to write a three hour episode of Monday Night Raw and I guarantee you it will be the best episode that Monday Night Raw has in over 10 years. So I laid out my plans, all right? Picture this. Vince McMahon, after a huge walkout, a huge walkout, right? Is forced to resign from his position as chairman and CEO as per an agreement that he made with his son, his son-in-law, and his daughter, mainly Shane McMahon, Stephanie McMahon, and Triple H, in no particular order. So opening package an opening package that night sees a very interesting turn of events so Triple H comes out to do a promo you know usually in the way that that all shows start and of course you know, before the promo begins you know the introductory pyro for the show, obviously, because there hasn't been an introductory pyro to our main roster show in about a year and a half. Because I guess Vince McMahon hates pyro. He has all this money, but he doesn't want to use pyro for any of his main shows. So Triple H cuts a promo, and you know he's he's decked in his usual authority figure attire. You know, because he's the CFO of the WWE and the owner of NXT. He cuts this promo explaining that he is now the new chairman of World Wrestling Entertainment. And that from here on in, Monday Night Raw is going to be decent again. It's going to be great again. And so, he decides to book a tournament for the following week collectively on Raw and SmackDown next in the next week following this one obviously to crown a number one contender basically no, 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 to crown what would essentially be the first new world heavyweight champion since 2013 essentially I'm suggesting that the WWE bring the big gold belt back since it was used from 2002 to 2013 when it was merged with the WWE title to create what we now know as the SmackDown WWE title so an opening match starts the show Becky Lynch and Shayna Baszler Shayna and Bex, essentially, taking on the Iconics in what will apparently be their last title defense as women's champions on Raw. And in an absolute four minute cluster frack, Becky Lynch and Shayna Baszler, the newly formed team, squash the Iconics in a four minute squash fest that essentially sees Shayna and Becky winning the the Raw Tag Team titles for the women's brand the Raw women's titles so that happens and then not too long after that we get a promo from Shane McMahon from what used to be Vince's office 
who explains to the viewers at home that he has now become the new CEO of WWE, having taken the position previously from his dad, and explains essentially that he has taken over production as well from Kevin Dunn, who trips Stephanie and Shane fired earlier the night before the show began. And so we cut to a package. We cut to a package featuring the legendary Mark Calloway, ring name The Undertaker, in a Hall of Fame package promoting his incoming Hall of Fame induction for the 2020 class. Right after the promo airs, the crowd is going nuts over this, and then Finn Balor, of course, does a heel move by interrupting said segment by cutting a promo on how he's been a fan of The Undertaker his entire life and that if there were any man he would want to face before said man retires, that it would be The Undertaker, that, the, that if the only person... Undertaker should face that should retire him it should be Finn Balor next thing we know we get an unexpected surprise from the dead man himself who of course appears for the very first time without his dyed hair albeit in his usual Undertaker get up his phenom get up and so Undertaker shows up makes his entrance albeit without the dyed hair or beard, thereby revealing that he's aged quite a bit over the last 10 to 15 years. And so Finn and Undertaker have a speechless, wordless confrontation looking at each other And then Undertaker, of course, looks at him while at the same time directing himself towards the pointing of the Titantron, which reads in plain English, WrestleMania, basically the WrestleMania 36 logo. Right? Now here's where this really gets intense. Undertaker... Undertaker and Finn, Finn looks a little confused, obviously, because he never expected this. It just happened out of the blue. But Finn and Undertaker apparently show respect for each other and without saying a word in the, and said exchange, they do Undertaker's signature cutthroat. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a brief demonstration. They, in unison, signature cutthroat Undertaker and Fendi essentially agreeing to said match at Wrestlemania Undertaker then makes his entrance felt after leaving by turning back in his signature double take and then grabbing a mic to tell Undertaker to tell Finn essentially that he'll see him at Wrestlemania and so the segment concludes and Finn is a little confused doesn't know what to think but at least he knows he's getting the match that quite frankly we all have been wanting for about a year now you know we could have had Undertaker and Sting that never happened we could have had Undertaker and Abyss that never came about because Abyss was loyal to TNA at that time and didn't want to jump ship to WWE because he was the star at he was the main attraction at TNA. So another segment comes about, right? And Stephanie is of course in front of Titan Tower And she cuts a promo explaining her position in the company. 
apparently she is now the president of this, the executive president of WWE. And also the general manager of Raw. Well, I don't, I don't know. That probably wouldn't turn out too well. But she reveals herself to be the new executive president of WWE and hints that if ever I were to make a decision that isn't favorable in the eyes of my brother or my brother-in-law they can choose to override it whenever they see fit so that's the conclusion of the segment and then of course after we go to commercial break we return to the segment of Undertaker and Finn briefly in a replay essentially just a brief replay about and the commentators are shocked by this they don't know what to think they just they flat out announce that they've just gotten word that Undertaker and Finn Balor have been announced for WrestleMania in what is essentially in what is essentially Undertaker's last ride Notice the pun on his finisher from his American badass days. All right. Bottom line, that match is set in stone officially. So we get another match between the Raw men's tag champs, the Revival taking on the... I can't remember which referred to... But basically, the Revival versus the Usos in a interbrand title unification match to crown the first ever WWE World Tag Champ. World Tag Champs, essentially. So, it's basically a 20-minute match. Or actually, no. It's, it's a 14-minute match. With all the trimmings, all the action that you could possibly get between the Usos and the Revival because apparently they have some very awesome chemistry together somehow. I've seen their matches, I know. So after 14 minutes, for some reason, the Revival, despite being on the jaws of defeat, are somehow able to do their, I, I don't know what it is, Magic Killer or or their finisher basically they do their finisher and they come out victorious and you know they the raw tag champs defeat the usos the smackdown tag champs to become the first wwe world tag champs or at least as of late since the world tag team title was previously on raw but of course merged itself to form the tag belts of some kind which would then divide itself upon Smackdown and Raw and then be unified again tonight on that night in question as I would book it and then the Revival celebrate their victory and the Usos of course they struggle to their feet and the Revival apparently in a in a work of good sportsmanship off of their hand out to the Usos and they shake the Revival's hand, the Usos do. Not a moment after the War Raiders known in WWE main roster as the Viking Raiders and before the Viking Experience, formerly known as War Machine in NXT initially, apparently are reverted back to their original War Raiders name in NXT from before they went up to the main roster and Vince killed them and killed their gimmick and any hope of them being able to be a mainstay. So they attack the Usos, they attack the Revival with very convincing finishing maneuvers to such an extent to where both the Usos and the Revival are incapacitated to where they can't stand up without medical assistance. As they're carried out on stretchers, all four of them are, the now rechristened War Raiders with Sarah Logan, by the way, who is either Hanson's wife or Rose, I can't tell which, I think it's Hanson's wife now because I think him and her married, 
But they, alongside Sarah Logan, cut this promo, this very unique promo. You know, and, and they say, and they say, straight up, we quit this company months ago because Ms. McMahon never had any trust and faith in us at all, even throughout our time as NXT, because he doesn't watch it. And so, they have a conversation with Triple H. They're able to do some backstage politicking to where they are able to somehow, how do I say this? To where they were able to somehow return to their initial War Raiders gimmick that they had in NXT before jumping ship to the main roster and being dubbed quote-unquote the Viking Experience, which is not to be confused with the Norwegian Cruise Line of the exact same name. Why they haven't sued WWE yet is beyond me. But the War Raiders explain that now that Vince is retired and Triple H, seeing as though he's always had trust and faith in us, gave us back our War Raiders moniker, we'd like to challenge the newly crowned world tag champs in the Revival to a match at the next pay-per-view, which I'll get to in just a moment. I'll explain that later. Meanwhile, Two, a mini tournament a mini tournament takes place right on this episode of Raw. One of which was a dark match, which was the first semifinal triple threat, of which Roman Reigns was able to come out victorious. And in the second match, was which was also a dark match by this point, Samoa Joe defeated. Well, actually, no, that's that's going to be on the. Um, well, Samoa Joe defeated Brock Lesnar with a coquina clutch to secure his entry into the one-on-one -on -one encounter for later tonight, which would apparently lead up to the main event. Meanwhile, at the beginning of the show, just before the show went on the air, like five, about ten minutes ago, before the show aired, Reigns and Joe had an unannounced, unseen confrontation and essentially footage was played from before the show of Reigns and Joe having an intense brawl throughout the entire arena of which Triple H and Shane were able to break it up and announce that the two would compete in several triple threat matches each of which would take place one after the other, and that Joe's match would take place right now. Of course, Joe would win that match, and then Roman's right after. So Reigns and Joe qualified to be in this match tonight. That would determine the number one contender to the Miz's Intercontinental title. Yeah, I'm just going to put that out there. So, before the main event, a 20-minute classic between Lars Sullivan and Braun Strowman. And Braun Strowman and Lars Sullivan, having come back from injury not too long before, Engage in a 20-minute last man standing match of which somehow After all the hell that he had been through after all the beating that he had took from the hands of Braun Strowman Managed to survive said last man standing match at the 20-minute mark after Braun Strowman was buried under the announce table and Lars Sullivan essentially did 
an elbow slam from the top rope, which he never does, by the way. He usually does the flying headbutt. That's the only top rope move that he does. But he did an elbow drop from the top rope onto the announce table with Strowman under it, thus winning the match and rendering Strowman unable to answer the count of 10. And so, what comes about is Eric Rowan, after this match concludes, attacks Lars Sullivan on his ex-tag team partner's behalf, meaning Braun Strowman, because they were both part of the or both a part of the Wyatt family, and then. The two stand together, Strowman and Rowan Strowman and Rowan do, and in the meantime we get an interruption. This interruption, of course, is the result which leads into the much long awaited debut of Bray Wyatt's Firefly Funhouse gimmick live on Monday Night Raw, after months and months and months and months of promotion, essentially. And he has with him Braun Strowman, and of course he he does his usual his usual um, his Firefly Funhouse skit, except he does it live, and he has Luke Harper by his side, and of course a masked figure, zombie warrior princess, in the form of Nikki Cross, who is eventually revealed as Sister Abigail. Thus, Harper and Wyatt and Sister Abigail tease a reunion of the Wyatt family in all its span. And Bray Wyatt, of course, cuts these promos reminiscent of what he was as opposed to what he is now under this clean-cut, you know, toned-down, somewhat exaggerated satanic Mr. Rogers but that segment ends and the typical blink and you miss it package that plays during the lead up to one of the Wyatt's family entrances of course that plays and all of a sudden they're gone and the commenter and the commentators are like where the hell did they go to and then of course we later learn that, of course, they made their exit and that their whereabouts are unknown. So, so far, from what I can tell, 38 minutes of wrestling, right? Including about 15 to 20 minutes of wrestling on the dark matches leading up to this aired episode of Raw. So, counting the dark matches, that's around 53 minutes to an hour. So, the main event. The main event sees Roman Reigns, the most overpushed, overhyped wrestler of all time. And I am definitely going to put that out there because that's exactly what he is. He's overhyped to no end. Taking on Samoa Joe to determine the number one contender to the Miz's Intercontinental title at the newly reinstated Bad Blood pay per view. This match, although the fans completely crapped on it, even before the entrances of Roman and Joe came about, were actually shocked to see that Reigns and Joe were able to have a masterclass worthy match. So this goes on for 17 minutes, with the end result being Samoa Joe locking up a clean and clutch on Roman Reigns with Roman Reigns somehow managing to power out with a coquina clutch of his own stealing Joe's finisher and Samoa Joe having come close to passing out on several occasions by this point after it being held on him for two minutes somehow finds the strength slowly but surely and the fans are getting more and more hyped up over this Samoa Joe somehow gets back on his feet and lifts Reigns up 
for a devastating power bomb that essentially implodes the ring. Of course, the ref in charge of the match does not realize that the match is not going and thinks about calling it off until he realizes that somehow Reigns and Joe were still moving, but Joe far more over Reigns, who's completely out of it. So Samoa Joe pins Roman Reigns 1-2-3 to become the Miz's challenger for the Intercontinental title at the newly reconstructed, newly reinstated Bad Blood pay-per-view. And then, of course, what happens at the end of that is actually kind of shocking. So what happens is Triple H comes out and in a nod to the first season of the Ultimate Fighters season finale, commends the two for their extraordinary work and therefore cannot give one man a shot without the other so he makes it a triple threat match meaning the Miz, Joe and Reigns are competing in a three-way dance as Triple H words it in in the style of Paul Heyman no less so Paul Levesque well they, they they shorten the, they silence the S because the S is pronounced silently. So it's really Levesque. But Paul Levesque then, of course, at that moment, makes it a three-way dance. Essentially a no disqualification triple threat match in which the Miz will be defending his intercontinental belt at the newly reinstated Bad Blood against Reigns and Joe, Samoa Joe specifically. Two Joes essentially, except Joe is Roman Reigns and Samoa Joe is Samoa Joe, obviously. So Miz against two Joes. And we cut to black and that's the end of the episode. Now tell me that's not a damn good script. Tell me that would not make the best episode of Monday Night Raw in over 10 years. It's just got to work, right? Unfortunately, Vince McMahon, as long as he's alive, will never take this idea. And neither will Kevin Dunn. Fortunately, when Vince McMahon decides to step down and or dies, which is going to be the latter, by the way, he's going to end up dying before he steps down. Because when Triple H takes over, we all know what Trips is going to do. He's going to fire Kevin Dunn. So, that's pretty much the end of that, right? So, counting the dark matches, it's a total of one hour and around 20 minutes. An hour and 20 minutes of wrestling. Of course, including a few backstage segments here and there regarding the disbanding of the 24-7 title and the wild card rule because neither of those were going to work anyway. They weren't worth a darn to start with. But we all know that. But yeah, I mentioned this idea that I pitched to so many Badgers and his friend who were, who were streaming at the time, them playing Forza Horizon 4 together. I think that's what the game's called. Or motors or motorsport, whatever that that game is. I don't fucking know. I don't give a shit. But anyway, they thought it was a great idea, a fantastic idea, and quite a few people in the chat agreed with me that night. So yeah, I say that sums it up quite nicely, doesn't it? Yeah. Woo! Ric Flair impersonation. Mary. That's all Jolson. Hey, uh, bro, you got something to eat there? Stereotypical Brooklyn accent. Hey, I'm from Boston. You got some of those Boston crabs there? My half-brother's 
my my impersonation of my half brother because you know he has he has a Boston accent now that he's been living there for so many years. He actually he he doesn't go by Devin anymore. He goes by a new first name. I think it's um. I think it's Levi. So, my my half brother, who's five years older than me, formerly named Devin Anderson, is now known as Levi. I don't know what his last name is though. So, eh. My impersonation of a brutal death metal singer. But yeah, you guys understand it. You know. Yeah, man. That's pretty much that. So. Imagine if, if I were given the opportunity to sing the national anthem at a baseball game somewhere down the line. Not that that's ever going to happen. It's not. I don't expect that. that I'm, I'm not even counting on it at this point. But say that I were given that chance. You know, because I hope I'd get to see the High Toms play again. It's been like at least 9 to 10 years since I've been able to see them in action at Finch Park or Finch Field or whatever it is. So essentially, if I, was, if I were able to sing the National Anthem, of course, the Star Spangled Banner, Not only would the people recognize me, but I think they would come to see that this is the welcome back that I would want or something. And then, of course, I do my usual seventh inning dance because I like I love to do those at the end of every seventh inning stretch. Before, of course, the music came on after the singing of Take Me Out of the Ball Game. But yeah, that's that's what I'd like to do back in the day when I was 15 at Finch Field at Finch field you know because I, I would dance and make a complete jack off of myself make a complete ass of myself while dancing you know but I remember I remember challenging the Thomasville high Tom to the to a to a dance off and I ended up surprisingly winning it and the mascot was was basically bound before me because because he knew that I had pretty good dance skills I don't think I have good dance skills. I think I suck as a dancer, personally. You should have seen me dancing in 2009. Holy crap, would I was I sucky back then as a dancer. I didn't even have any kind of coordination about me whatsoever. But darn me if I wasn't going to have a good time making a fool of myself. Yeah. So there is another part of my life that I didn't want to talk about before that I'd be more than happy to share with you guys now and just did. You're welcome. So, with everything going on, would it really be a surprise about the state of everything? See, You can love Donald Trump, you can hate him, you can choose to ignore him, but from my own perspective, from what I've seen of his accomplishments in the first two years as president, he has done more than any other president before him except the good ones, seven of which came before him, combined. So out of 45 presidents that we've had, only eight, which include Donald Trump, by the way, seven if you don't include him, actually ever did any good for this nation. You know, Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Lincoln, you know, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Reagan, and now Trump. So I'll just, I'll just go ahead and count that off again. Let me see, let me see. We've only had eight good presidents in this country, one of which is serving as POTUS now. And that's that's of course Donald Trump being one of them. But I'm gonna lay, I'm gonna name off the list in 
in chronological order. The first good president we had was Donald, no, no, Donald, was George Washington. You thought I was going to say Donald Trump. First president we had that was a good one was George Washington. The second good one we had was Thomas Jefferson. The third good one we had, of course, was James Madison. The next one to come after him was Abraham Lincoln. After that came Eisenhower, which was another good president and the fifth in my list of decent presidents that did anything possible to make sure that the people would thrive. The Americans, meaning we the people, all the people, except for the illegal immigrants because they don't count. They're invaders. They're terrorists. And then, of course, John F. Kennedy and then Ronald Reagan and now Donald Trump. So, of the 45 presidents that we have had so far, Donald Trump being our current one, there were only seven people before Trump who actually ever did any good for this country and never put politics over everything else. It's amazing to me how I'm able to know this stuff. And you know, despite Donald Trump's mistakes, he's made a few mistakes. I'll give the devil his due on that. Despite his mistakes, Donald Trump has easily cemented himself towards the path of becoming probably the greatest president that we have had since Abraham Lincoln. You know, it's just, it's, it's hard being Donald Trump. When you are the President of the United States doing the work that 535 politicians in Washington will not do. That's how you know America is in an irreversibly sorry state of affairs. I am sorry. But if you believe that politicians are ever going to do any good for this country, then you clearly don't know anything about history. I'm not knocking on you. I don't, I'm not going to say that you're wrong. But at the end of the day, guys, I've observed firsthand what Donald Trump was like. I went to one of his rallies, I know. I think it was June of 2016, I believe. I went to one of his rallies. And he delivered one of the greatest speeches I've ever heard in my life. And I saw this in person, in person. He said that we would make America strong again. We would make America safe again. We would make America wealthy again. And we would make America great again. And what's the one thing that he's been doing since he was elected in November of 2018? Of, of 16, I mean. November of 2016. What's the first thing that he did? He went towards the path of making America great again. And he's been succeeding at it ever since, despite many setbacks. And in the meantime, half of the country hates him and the other half likes him. I personally am one of the 63 million people who voted Donald John Trump into the presidency. And I will be more than happy to vote for him again in 2020 next year on the next electoral cycle. Because I know that he's earned my vote a hundred thousand fold. I mean, he's not a politician. He's a businessman. An entrepreneur, a multi-billionaire who dedicated his life towards helping others and making the world a better place in his own special way. Anyway, ladies and gents, that is going to do it for this stream. I am all tapped out. And in the meantime, I thank you one and all once again for having spent yet another 50 minutes of your eyes and life dealing with my sorry ass. Yeah! <laughs> but, but anyway, until next time, I will see you guys later on in the week on Wednesday. And here's a song that's going to take you out. Right? Yeah. There's your song. So... Yeah. 
I'll go ahead and close this out with this instrumental that I made on Audio Sauna. Because of course I can. I can do that. It's my stream. I'll do whatever the heck I want. As long as I keep my swearing to a minimum. Right? Yeah. But yeah, if ever you guys feel like following me, you're more than welcome to do so. If you don't, that's okay. I'm alright with it either way. I just appreciate your time, I do. Yeah. So until next time, have a good one.
Ladies and gentlemen, that's going to do it for this one. I have been Kevin the Skull Anderson. You have been my very loyal, very supportive viewers. Until Wednesday, this is Kevin the Skull Anderson reminding you, happy gaming and big cheese balls. Have yourself a couple of cheese balls for a snack. They're really good. And I'm talking about the snack kind. You know, the style Chester Cheetah. Whatevs. See you on the next one. It's me, it's me, it's the S K U double L I I am the skull. You are my loyal viewers. I thank you very much once again. And since the last stream went so well, since the last stream went so unfathomably beautifully, I decided I'm going to do a bonus one just because I feel like it. I'm going to do a bonus one for all of you because you deserve it and you've earned it. Yes, indeedy. You're getting a bonus stream from me! Cue that beautiful intro. That's going to be the theme song to my... That's going to be the intro song to my streams from now on, by the way. I want to keep that in mind. Before I forget. sample of my latest My Paradox track in the form of The Millennial Judgment is going to be the theme song and the intro introductory song to my Skull Media gaming streams from here on in people.